Uh, hello lovelies, in this video the Brilliant Doc Prep Wiz is going to talk to you about surface area to volume ratio for your A-level body. Now this feels a little bit counterintuitive but if we look at the maths behind it and it is only gentle maths you'll see it all becomes really obvious. Surface area to volume ratio. So surface area to volume ratio, biology, we use it as a way of describing how close every internal part or, for example, cell of an organism is, how close it is to the outside surface, the external surface. And this will be important for explaining how organisms exchange substances. How do they get things from outside of their environment into the inside of their bodies? And how do they get substances from inside their bodies out, like waste materials? So that's why it's important to us and that's why it's important to start off this topic with surface area to volume ratio. So we calculate it by doing the surface area and then dividing it by the volume. Obviously, organisms that are irregularly shaped are going to be hard to actually calculate the surface area and the volume ratio accurately. So often in the exam, you'll either be given this, or if you are asked to calculate it, we will be able to use cubes or spheres as like models for the organisms that we're talking about. There are no units as well. So when we're calculating, we will need to use like millimeters squared and millimeters cubed, for example, but we aren't gonna to need to have any units for our actual surface area volume ratio at the end. Okay, so I've got two cubes here, so we'll just quickly recap how you calculate surface area and volume, and then we'll look at how we calculate surface area to volume ratio and what that means for these organisms. So surface area of my cube here is one times one because the length of one side is one centimetres. So one times one times six because there are six faces to my cube. So that gives me six centimetres squared. Now for volume, we do length times height times depth or length times height width times depth, however you do it. So that's going to be one centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter or one centimeter cubed. So I've done exactly the same for my big cube. And that's obviously 10 centimeters cubed per side instead of one centimeter cubed per side. So we've increased the sort of length of one side by a factor of 10. But you can see the impact that's had on the surface area and the volume. The volume increases at a much higher rate so the size difference is massive compared to the surface area when you increase it by the same amount so what i would say is that is a factor that is explaining why we have this difficulty as we get to be a larger organism is that our volume increases much faster than our surface area for every amount of size that we gain so here's my small cube and my big cube again, but we're gonna imagine that these are now representing organisms. So my small cube is representing a small organism like a hummingbird, and then my large cube is representing a large organism like an elephant. So to calculate the surface area to volume ratio, I take the surface area and divide it by the volume for each one. So that's six divided by one for my small organism. So my surface area to volume ratio is six, for my large organism, that's 600 divided by 1,000, which gets us to 0.6. So we have the opposite effect. So my small organism has the larger surface area to volume ratio, and my large organism has the smaller surface area to volume ratio. This makes sense because we said that bottom number is going to become much bigger in a large organism because the volume increases much more as we get bigger than the surface area does. So let's think about explaining what this means. The small organism has a high surface area to volume ratio. So this means that every internal part of that organism is a quite a short distance away from the surface. So this is going to be important when we start thinking about exchange. The opposite is true then for the larger organism because it has a low surface area to volume ratio. So internal parts, especially the ones right in the middle, are going to be a fairly long distance away from the surface of the organism. So why does surface area to volume ratio matter? Well, 
it all comes down to diffusion. We know that diffusion distance is one of those factors that affects the rate of diffusion. And we hopefully know that most substances that move in and out of organisms rely on diffusion. All organisms, whatever their size, so from single celled bacteria to the elephant, they're going to need to exchange substances with their environment in order to survive. They're going to need to take in substances from the outside, the atmosphere, or from nutrition wise, from food. So they need to take in biological molecules from food and nutrients and oxygen as well. And that needs to move into the cells. And equally, they will need to remove waste substances from the body. So carbon dioxide and urea, they need to diffuse out. And so all of the fact that they need to do this, they also need to make sure they can monitor and regulate their temperature and water levels. And we know that water moves in and out of cells by osmosis, which is governed by the same rules as diffusion. And temperature works in a similar way. So heat radiates out of the body or it is absorbed by the body as well. So most substances are exchanged by diffusion. And we've talked about the fact that if you have a large distance between all of your internal cells and your surface, because you have a low surface area to volume ratio, then you are going to find it hard to just let substances diffuse, say, through your skin and try and get to all of those internal cells. It would just take too long and you just wouldn't be able to get enough of the substances you need in or enough of the waste substances out to survive. However, if you're something like a single celled amoeba or something very, very small, then you can rely on that diffusion just through the surface. Surface area to volume ratio and metabolic rate. We need to be able to talk about metabolic rate and metabolic demand as two definitions, which are important here for explaining and understanding why surface area to volume ratio is really important. So metabolic rate is the amount of energy used by an organism to carry out metabolic reactions. So that's anything where a substance is being made or a substance is being broken down. And we normally measure that in a fixed time, for example, daily. So your daily metabolic rate is the amount of energy you need to carry out all the metabolic reactions you need to carry out to keep you alive. Metabolic demand then is the volume of oxygen and nutrients that you need daily to maintain respiration to supply enough energy to the body for that metabolic rate to be kept up. So obviously we know that respiration is included in your metabolism, it is a metabolic reaction, but what we're talking about here is you obviously need a lot of energy to carry out all of the other metabolic reactions that you use every day. So the demand or metabolic demand is just the idea of how much input do we need into the body in order to maintain that energy level to keep you alive on a daily basis. This is important because as we increase our mass or size, as an organism's size increases, the metabolic rate increases. And this is because they're carrying out more respiration because obviously they're requiring more energy in order to keep up that metabolic rate. This means that we know the link between the rate of the exchange of substances, so substances going in and out of the body, is dependent on the surface area and how much surface area is in contact with the external environment. But we also know that as organisms get bigger, their surface area to volume ratio gets smaller, but they have an increased metabolic rate or an increased metabolic demand to supply that metabolic rate. So if you're a large organism, how are you going to possibly make sure that you can absorb and exchange all the substances that you need to in order to be alive? Because we can't rely on diffusion simply through their external surface because it would be too slow because the distance is too great. And we wouldn't be able to absorb enough oxygen, and enough nutrients to satisfy that metabolic demand in order to satisfy the metabolic rate. So we wouldn't be able to survive. So larger multicellular organisms have come up with a way of fixing this by developing and evolving internal exchange 
and transport systems. So we've got an example here, we've got our digestive system and gas exchange system, they are our internal exchange systems, and then we've got our circulatory system, that's our transport system, so transport all of those substances to every cell in our body. This is to maximise the rate of gas exchange, the rate of nutrient exchange or nutrient absorption, and also waste excretion. The mass transport systems allow substances to be transported a short distance from all cells. So when your nutrients and your um, oxygen are dissolved and taking it, traveling around the body in your blood plasma, they get taken right to where cells are, very, very close to cells. So then that exchange with the cells happens at a really short diffusion distance. And because we've taken it to there, because there's no way that substances would have been able to diffuse through the body. So we make sure we do that. And that doesn't just go for humans, obviously. There are lots of organisms that have transport systems. Some are more complicated than others. The larger the organism is, the more complex the system. There's an example there of a cricket or a locust, and they still have a respiratory system, even though they're quite small. So there's reasons for all of these, but a lot of it is because there's some organisms that simply can't rely on just diffusion through the outside of their skin. All exchange systems have the same three adaptations in common. These all help to increase the rate of substance exchange inside organisms. They have thin walls to create short diffusion distances. They have a large surface area to increase the amount of membrane or surface that's in contact with the substances that need to be exchanged. They have a good blood or air supply, which we call ventilation, to maintain concentration gradients. All of these are obviously factors that affect the rate of diffusion, and that's really what we're talking about here. So some examples are the fact that leaves are thin, so there's a short distance between the air and the inside of the leaf. We've got the folds of villi in the small intestine, which increase surface area and structures like the alveoli, which have lots of capillaries around them, which is a form of good blood supply, which will help maintain the concentration gradient. So as we go through this topic, you'll notice these same features coming up again and again, because these are adaptations for gas exchange or digestion and the movement of substances across membranes. Okay, so we're going back to look at metabolic rate for a second. So although I said that small animals have a lower metabolic rate and as we increase in size we get a larger metabolic rate, that's not incorrect. However, because small organisms have a high surface area to volume ratio, they lose heat really quickly and really easily. This means that they actually have a higher metabolic rate per unit of mass compared to a larger organism. This is because they need more energy from respiration in order to maintain their body temperature, so to try and replace the heat that they're losing. So this is why we do talk about increasing size equals increasing metabolic rate, but actually because of their large surface area to volume ratio, small organisms have a higher metabolic rate per unit of mass, so relative to their size, because they need to maintain and replace all that body heat they're losing. So they need a higher rate of respiration to provide the heat for that. So this is why, and it creates a few kind of rules in nature. So without special adaptations, there are very few small organisms that can survive in cold environments. And actually there's probably a size limit um, especially unless you have some special adaptations to being able to prevent heat loss that can actually survive in really, really cold environments like the Arctic. Also, small organisms tend to have a really high heart rate because obviously they need to increase the pumping of the blood around the body, increase respiration rate, so they need increased oxygen travelling to those tissues, and they need to eat constantly. You may have heard about this for examples like the little rat that we've got here or even the hummingbird. There's organisms like this when they're very, very small. Because of their high metabolic rate, they need literally to kind of 
take in a really high amount of calories and they basically need to constantly eat throughout the day in order to get enough energy from their food to keep up this high metabolic rate. This often means that because of their high heart rate, because of this high metabolic rate, their lifespans are often quite short, so they don't live very long because maintaining this level of um, high metabolic rate is actually obviously really stressful and works the body really hard. So the higher your metabolic rate per unit of mass, then the shorter your lifespan genuinely. Um, think about the opposite effect, something like an elephant or a blue whale, something that's really, really large, their metabolic rate per unit of mass will be a lot slower. And so therefore they do tend to live a really long time. Ouch. This is why in some videos I explain scratches. <laughs>